Hello and good afternoon. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all today to this online event centered around the iProtunus Mobility Scheme. My name is Cory Moore, and over the next just over two hours, I will be introducing you to a fantastic lineup of expert speakers and panelists, where it's our aim to understand how to best facilitate cross-border mobility for artists and cultural professionals, with a particular focus on sustainable and inclusive practices. Funded by the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union, iProtunus is a pilot project aimed to trial a new mobility model scheme for artists, creators and cultural professionals. The programme is led by a consortia of cultural organisations, which includes a pilot scheme focusing on individual artists. This is led by the Goethe Institute, together with Institut Francais and Isolatia. The main objective of this scheme is to connect artists internationally and also to support international collaboration among all the countries participating in the Creative Europe programme. Mobility of artists remains a high priority for the EU for the years to come, particularly with regards to the cultural sector. So it's vital that we take the time now to consider what learnings and reflections we can take forward with us. Now, I have a little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. You can view the entire detailed agenda right here on this platform, and that will detail everything around the two keynote speakers that we have, including as well the two panel discussions on sustainability and inclusion, respectively. This session will also be recorded, so you have the opportunity to look at it again online, and there will be subtitles available as well. Now, of course, I won't be the only one asking the questions today. We'd love to hear from you. And for that, we're going to be using a nifty little tool called Slido. Many of you will be familiar with this tool, thanks to the myriad of online events and conferences we've had recently. But if you're not, do not worry. We're going to start by warming up a little bit with Slido now by conducting a little quiz before the full agenda kicks off. So in that vein, I'd like to ask you to open up Slido on your browsers. You should see the link here posted on the platform. I'll give you a minute to get that opened up. And we can start with the first of our three little quiz questions to get warmed up. OK, let's do this. Question number one, despite the pandemic, out of the 1,882 applications received in 2021, how many individual artists actually successfully received an iProtunus Mobility Grant? Twenty seconds on the clock for that one. We can now reveal the answer. It is indeed 320 individual artists. That's 190 applications out of the 1,882. So that's 10% of all received applications. So let's move on to the next question. Question number two. What is the percentage of iProtunus grantees traveling by train, bus, car, or boat? So specifically not traveling by flight, by plane. 20 seconds on the clock. What percentage of iProtunus grantees traveled by train, bus, car, or boat? The answers have been revealed, I think. That is 26%. Not a very high number of people are not flying, indeed. So let's move on to the third and final question. This is a true or false question. I mentioned it in the intro, so I hope we have 100% correctness here. Only artists and cultural professionals living in EU countries can apply for iProtunus Mobility Grant. True or false? I think that was about 20 seconds. The answer is, of course, false. Applications from Creative Europe countries can apply. That includes the EU countries and neighboring countries, such as, wait for it, Armenia, Georgia, Tunisia, the Ukraine, Norway, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Iceland, Moldova, North Macedonia, and our favorite non-EU country today, the UK. 
Okay, thank you very much for participating. We're all warmed up. We know how Slido works. This is the tool where we want you to post your questions and comments. And at the end of the panel discussions, I will bring in your questions to ask to the group. So now it is time for me to introduce our first keynote speaker, Maria Gabriel, who is the Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth. In her opening keynote, Commissioner Gabriel will share with us why we should be supporting the mobility of artists and cultural professionals in Europe. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are going to be sharing a bit of the importance about why we should be supporting mobility of artists and cultural professionals. The floor is yours, Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, I would like just to, to apologize for being a little bit late, but as you know, actually we have our European Education Summit and I try really to participate as actively as possible. But for me, it's so important to be here with you. So dear friends, it is a real, real pleasure to, to join you today to hear about the wonderful results of Eportunus. But I would like to start by thanking the Goethe Institute. I see, I see you, Johannes. What a pleasure to be here with you. The Institute Francais and Isolatia, the consortium that organized the first ever European funded mobility scheme in culture. And as we'll hear in today's conference, the results have been extremely positive and inspiring. I believe there is two main reasons uh, why we need to support first mobility of artists and cultural professionals in Europe. First, I want to recall that mobility as a whole has been a huge force for the cohesion of our union. Mobility is truly emblematic of our European project. Mobility really allows Europeans to connect to each other and to express ourselves each one of us together. And it truly encapsulates the motto of the union, united in diversity. Just think of how defining Erasmus has been for an entire generation and for our young people to feel European, but also think of how much culture has been shared thanks to Erasmus, music, books, films, language, architecture, and dance. And in Europe, we are also used to, to sharing our culture and our heritage, notably thanks to the well-known and successful scheme of the European Capitals of Culture, or thanks to emblematic prizes such as the European Book Prize. But with ePortunus first project in 2019, we went, I think, one step further with the promotion of the mobility of cultural professionals and artists, the need for introducing a mobility scheme in culture has been highlighted in several studies, but I would like to reassure you, I will not mention all of them. What is important for me is to see that there is a real need. And second, I would like to underline that we know that mobility has a huge positive impact on people's life. Its benefits are well documented, People that participated in these programs often speak of it being life-changing, improving their intercultural understanding, widening their horizons, making friends, and expanding their network. And we know this was the case for culture during the first Eportunus project in 2019. This initiative has, has been embraced by our cultural landscape. Just look at the high demand in applications, both pre and post COVID-19. Look at the levels of satisfaction and praise for those who took part. This is what gives a sense of purpose to projects. The artists and the cultural communities are telling us the initiative is needed and good for them. And this is so important. As we all know, artists, so often lack this kind of investment of support to grow in their craft. And going abroad helps these artists access new career opportunities, new audiences, new markets. It helps create jobs in the cultural and creative sectors. It helps our societies discover each other and the partnerships that result from this are truly valuable. 
So here I would like to share with you the experience of Joanna Zeber, who went from Poland to Georgia as a musical collaboration earlier this year. She had so much to say about the scheme, but from how great it was to be able to apply independently from an organization to how great it was to have contact with new audiences and how important it was to preserve the small scale feeling without needing too much bureaucracy. And we all know what we are talking about. In her own words, I think that this mobility program will be a very important factor for the development of careers of many artists all over Europe. The life of an artist has never been easy, but nowadays it is more challenging than ever. And I think this really cuts to the chase. Eportunus invests in our artist ambitions to grow, to experience more, to express them themselves better. So dear friends, where do we stand? Once again, I commend the Goethe Institute, the Institut Francais and the Consortium for their successful management of the two projects. Together with the project that the European Cultural Foundation started this year, we have already achieved significant outcomes. To date, more than 900 artists or cultural professionals have been funded to go abroad and collaborate with their peers. They have worked together, finding new audiences, learning from each other, and becoming more international. Eportunos appealed especially to young and emerging artists. This topic is close to my heart, as next year we'll have the European Year of Youth. Almost half of the applicants in the scheme were under 35, and more than half had an annual income of less than 10,000 euro. There was great geographical diversity, another topic close to my heart, and gender balance, providing the scheme addresses a shared need. Indeed, the mobility scheme was highly popular and received applications from 41 countries. I'm, I'm speaking under the control of people that know much better than me all these numbers. But it's so, so good to see that finally, almost 50% of these funded uh, project said that they received some type of employment offer as a result of this mobility. I think that this number is very important for our artists. And this is most impressive considering the financial support of only in many cases, 1,500 or 3,000 3, uh, euro. And these numbers tell an important story that testimonies such as Joanna's transform in real life priceless experience. Now, the third thing that I would like to share with you is, okay, uh, where we are, that's a great experience, but what's next? What's next for artists' mobility in Europe? And here, I'm really very happy that now with the new uh, Creative Europe program, this pilot project will become a permanent mobility scheme for culture and artists. I think that it's really important that this scheme will be rooted on the successful results of the Eportunus projects and will take account of the recommendations from everyone involved so far. So we wanted to cover all cultural sectors other than the audiovisual and provide regular calls throughout the year having consistent parameters, but allowing flexibility for the unexpected. And we are st sticking to what works. The new mobility scheme will accept applications from individuals as well as hosting organizations, preserving what Joanna Zeber considered so important, a small scale bottom up feeling. And we'll also make sure the scheme is flexible to tailor made projects, responding to the needs from individual artists and cultural professionals after all, this is meant to serve them. And we always have to remind this when we'll continue to talk about this project. So dear, dear friends, 
I want to reassure you, I will finish now because I talked a lot, but I think that it's quite obvious that this experience is very valuable for me too, because I'm learning a lot from our artists and I think that we should all stay mobilized to continue to strengthen our support for them. And this Eportunos project, it's a great example of what we need much more at European level. We need to scale these kind of projects. We need to convince all our member states to invest much more in our artists. So I think that that will be really my, my message. We need to continue to promote this project to ensure the visibility of the experiences of our art, uh, artists. But I want really to see much more synergies, synergies with other priorities of the European Commission and synergies with other instruments and fundings that, that we have. Because for all of us, it's important not only to talk about these initiatives, but to see them in, transformed into something tangible, operational and beneficial for our cultural and creative sectors and for our artists and profession, cultural professionals especially. So I will stop here. You can count on my firm support. Again, I would like to praise all your efforts, your extraordinary engagement on this. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your ideas, your deliberations, because I'm sure that as always, your ideas will inspire me uh, in order to be as concrete as possible and to continue together with you to shape the future of culture and cultural and creative sectors and our artists in Europe and for Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gabriel, for that very inspiring start to our discussions today. Thank you for taking the time. That was really wonderful. And it's great to hear how passionate and enthusiastic you are about mobility schemes for artists. That's wonderful. At this point now, I would like to hand over to Johannes Ebert. Johannes is the Secretary General of the Goethe Institute, and he's going to share with us his thoughts regarding mo artist mobility and the steps that iProtunus has taken thus far with particular regard to the current pandemic situation. Thank you, Johannes, for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Cory. Um, dear Commissioner Gabriel, uh, dear Maria, it's very good to see you. Also, it would be much better to meet personally again, but, uh, but I think we will do that in the, near in the near future. I'm happy about your support and your passion uh, for this project. Um, dear guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, uh, I'm in my office in Munich. It snowed the whole morning, so it's white outside. So we know that Christmas is coming close, but we still have a lot of work to do before that. And I'm very happy we found the time to discuss this very important project, uh, Eportunus. Looking back on the past two years, was it not an improbable bet to have implemented a mobility scheme for artists and cultural professionals in the middle of a pandemic? Yes, it was. Yet. It was exactly this period when mobility was brought to an almost complete standstill, when artists were deprived of, po of possibilities for exchange and international collaboration that showed how important physical encounters and mobility are, based on programs such as Eportunus. Many artists in Europe are working under precarious conditions, often aggravated by the dynamics of the pandemic to tap their full potential as part of the European civil society, artists need space and very often structural support for these professional exchanges and collaborations in times of crisis and beyond. Over these last sometimes tiring two years, our co consortium with Institut Francais, and I'm very happy that my colleague Eva Nguyen is taking part in this conference, and Isolazzi, I'm happy that Oksana Sarshevskaya Kravchenka is also here because uh, I was happy from the beginning that an Ukrainian organization is part of this consortium, not only because I lived in Kiev for five years and liked this country very much, but I think diversity also in, in the places who take part in the consortium is very important. Our consortium has supported more than 600 grantees from six different sectors, visual and performing arts, cultural heritage, music, literature translation, and architecture. 90% of them said that they would not have realized the mobility without Eportunus or would not have reached the same 
results. This is impressive. For many artists, the grant gave, and I quote, a kick in artistic projects and new ideas. One of the artists we supported even qualified the mobility grant as a, I quote, breath of fresh air and renewal after a year spent indoors. I can understand that very much. 600 artists, also 600 stories. And you, Maria, you told about already one. I will tell two more. It's about creative content and concrete, concrete experiences. For example, Marieke Bertou, who traveled with her sailing boat and a piano from France to Northern Ireland and Scotland, she was able to organize several concerts, develop artistic collaborations with local musicians, and extended her network for future opportunities. And this example, of course, successfully illustrates how mobility can fuse with art and green practices. Turan Siamir and her group went from Italy to Georgia to contribute to the renovation and give back to the community a famous wooden staircase part of the cultural heritage of Pilisi, featured in Georgian cinema. The project reminded us that cultural heritage belongs to us all. And I know that this is a, a topic which, which is also very uh, dear to you. For that reason, it deserves and must be preserved as part of our identity and as legacy for our future generations. These success stories are the reason why iPortunus exists. These are all the root reasons why iPortunus should continue. Let's be honest, it always hasn't been it, it, it hasn't always been easy. Both the grantees and our consortium had to show a large degree of flexibility, understanding, and capacity to continuously adapt to the unique pandemic situation that we have been facing during the last two years. Quarantine rules, everybody knows that. I had a test already this morning, so my nose still hurts. But <laughs> everybody knows that in these times, quarantine rules, spontaneous lockdowns, audience limitations, travel restrictions, and so on and so on. But the pandemic also gave us space and time to rethink the concept of mobility, especially in terms of green mobility and inclusion. And you, Commissioner Gabriel, said we have to look at projects from different angles and include other ideas from the European Union. And I think when I think about the Green Deal and Iportunus, I think this is something we have to think together. The European Commission foresees the most mobility scheme to be a permanent action, thank you very much, of the Creative Europe program. On the side of the Goethe Institute and our consortium, we strongly welcome this idea. Based on our experience of having led the two pilot phases of iPortunus since 2019, and from feedback collected via a multitude of channels as well as stakeholders, we see the great relevance and potential that the European Mobility Scheme holds for the professional development of artists and creative actors in Europe. And we would like to take the opportunity to highlight several elements that should inform such a future mobility scheme. First, the scheme should continue to provide direct structural support to individual artists and creative professional, professionals. And by doing this, strengthen the cultural sector in general. Second, this financial support should be flexible and based on the individual needs of artists when it comes to destination, duration, sector, approach, and the like. This is part of their creativity. The promotion of our environmental sustainability, inclusion, and diversity should be taken into consideration to a larger extent. So fourth, a hybrid dimension could also support inclusion and sustainability, but should not replace, and this is very important, and I think we all feel that, should not replace at any time the value of real physical exchanges. To reflect an opening, the mobility scheme to a more international dimension with the neighboring countries and maybe even beyond. Before giving the floor back to Corey Moore, I'd like to thank everyone who makes this program possible. You, of course, uh, uh, Commissioner Gabriel, Barbara Gessler and her team from the Creative Europe program, uh, their colleagues from the executive agency, as well as the European Parliament. Iportunis is a collaboration 
collaborative work of European cultural institutions. In addition to our consortium, as you said, there's the second consortium launched in 2020 under the lead of our colleagues from the European Cultural Foundation, together with Midost from Germany. I worked with Midost a long years when I was in, in Eastern Europe and Cultura Nova, Cultura Nova from Croatia. We are very happy they are here with us today in the panel discussion. We wish them all the best until the end of their project. I sincerely want to thank, of course, the consortium partners, the Institut Francais and Isolatio, and my own colleagues who are listening carefully to these discussions for more input and to, to develop this program further. Finally, and most importantly, I thank all the artists and participants of our programs that they took part, that they enlarged their creativity, and that we could learn from them how to develop this program further despite of the difficult circumstances of the pandemic. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a good conference and all the best, and thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much to Johannes Ebert from the Goethe Institute. That was a very inspiring talk as well. We can feel the passion in the room here, no matter where we're sitting around Europe. Um, Johannes, you, you quoted a couple of the artists there and about how, how much they got out of the project, which is great. But for the lovely audience here, you don't have to believe Johannes. You don't have to take his word for it. We actually have a brilliant video yet now prepared for you where you can hear from the artists themselves. Some of the beneficiaries of the program have been highlighted now in a video of portraits. So with that, enjoy this short video. And thank you again to both of you. We are now living in a very strange period, uh, COVID period, and uh, all is online. Iportunus uh, is giving still this, this vintage uh, opportunity of really traveling to one place and to really be there and to really dig into the culture of the place and to really cooperate with the, with the people. A commentary to how, why and how music can be amazing, <laughs> because by by such a little tiny uh, instrument, by such a pigeon flute, you could have uh, the whole world in front of you. We are here in Rome, translating a book that collects all the poems that Pier Paolo Pasolini, the poet, filmmaker and novelist, wrote about the city that uh, was the love of his life. There will always be a place for poetry in this fast, guided uh, society. I feel that architecture is the way I think of space, of everything that is around me. I think that it's mine and it's the way who I am. With sound you can be anywhere. You're collaborating with the listener to create the image. It's not on a plate for you like a movie where it's like this is what you're looking at. I'm wearing these gloves and for this performance they're registering whether my arms are up or down. You give people the sound but then they have to fill in the rest of the imagination. It's the ground we were needing. It's very important to have contact with other musicians in other places of the world just to increase our knowledge, just to, to be better musicians. Que es un, pam, pu, pam. Sabe, tres, eh. When I look at the plant, for me it's like, it's a sign of, of one period of a history of Bulgaria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
than a centimeter of concrete. Oh, yeah. It's the paradise for you. Changing from one place to the other, the thing that uh, keeps me going and make me feel at home in every place is to work with culture. Culture and art is like an essential uh, feature to bring exchange and unity. I also uh, like to have like a very like intro music, a bit of the overture. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important for the societies to be exposed to, to good quality and to something that, that is beyond you, something that is way more etheric. It really, really profoundly enriches us. An artist has to be open, open for new things, open for new ideas, open to try things that never tried before. The main point, like the diversity, the differences, the beauty of differences in the whole Europe, I can't uh, change all of the world, but I can just try to keep one building. That's what I, that's what I can do. We need to see things and experience things and collect knowledge. And the more we do it, the better places we can make. We can learn from people, like the best way of learning is to be around things that are different from you. By surrounding yourself with things that you only feel comfortable with, you never learn and you never stretch and you never grow. supporting the artists themselves on the ground. Thank you so much for that video. Joining me now, I have the great pleasure to introduce the president of Institut Francais, Eva nguyen Bin. Speaking of mobility, Eva, you, you appear to be in a car, which is great. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are going to give us a little bit of your perspective on the importance of supporting the individual artists. Thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yeah. I hope so. Well, um, dear Commissioner Maria Gabriel, dear Johannes, dear Johannes Ebert, dear Barbara Gessler, and dear all. Uh, yes, I am in a car. I have to say that I do anything to, uh, to be part of this session today. So I have to be in a car, but I think that uh, illustrates very well the importance of mobility. And I'm very happy and very proud to be with you today. I think it's, uh, it's a brilliant video. I think the video shows very much and s somehow better than anything I could say, the importance of, of mobility. Um, for us, at Institut Francais, the mobility, the international mobility is very much at the heart of, of what we do every day. And uh, it's very uh, much at the heart of what we believe we have to do. And uh, I think the mobility is, uh, uh, is the condition to allow people to meet each other, as was said very well in the video, but also to understand each other. By understanding each other, by talking to each other, we can, you know, um, make sense of what surrounds us. And I think it is very essential for the European Union to have such a program because, um, as we see, we need understanding within the European Union and we need uh, a way to reinforce, to strengthen the feeling of belonging to the e European Union. I think this feeling of belonging, this um, understanding of what makes uh, us Europeans is so important, especially in the context that we know now. I would like to especially thank our European partners, the Goethe Institute and Isolatia, as well as the European Commission indeed, to have allowed us to be part of this uh, prototype program. Uh, I will not come back to numbers, the number of grants, etc., because Johannes Ebert has said that very well. But I think this prototype program has showed the importance of the European mobility. 
within the European uh, Union, directly targeting individual artists and cultural professionals with self-initiated and concrete project-oriented mobilities that foster international collaboration. I think what Johannes Hebert said is very important. This is what we saw, is to be very, very close to the needs of the artists, to listen to them and to be there for um, to, to provide the meanings, to, um, to um, make their projects concrete and become a reality. I think we have now to move to a long-term program that will lead to greater intercultural dialogue and ultimately that will contribute to social cohesion across Europe with, uh, between the different countries, the different members of the European Union. I would like to come back to what Johannes Hebert said about mobility. There is a growing debate. I think it is a very important one that we also have to touch upon, uh, a growing debate on cultural practices, mobility, and the fight against climate change. I think we have to reflect on our uh, programs, on the way we work, in order to tackle that, in order to see what we can do to contribute to the fight against uh, climate change. International transportation and mobilities are at the heart of this debate. At the same time, we have to be very, very strong on our beliefs, and this is my personal belief, that nothing will ever replace the, um, the human contacts, the physical contacts, the encounters that we can do when we um, travel, when there is mobility. We have to find a balance between all these um, challenges. I think this is a very important topic to take upon um, and that will grow, uh, you know, more and more important um, as the borders hopefully will reopen. I think today's panel discussions will be a great opportunity to share all the consortium experience and to cross perspectives on the future of mobility in Europe for the artists. Um, uh, I, again, I would like to thank all the partners and I would like to thank you very much for inviting me. I would like to renew our commitment to build on the prototype project to, 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 to construct a more uh, sustainable program in the long term. I think this is so important for the artists, but beyond the artists, for our societies. I wish you, I wish us a very fruitful discussion this afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eva, for joining us, especially from the car. Safe journey wherever you're headed to. Thank you for your time. In just a few minutes, we will be starting the first of our two panel discussions. This one will focus on green mobility and really the two sides of the coin of what a green mobility scheme looks like and could look like. Yes, we want to encourage more environmentally means of transport, but we don't want to disadvantage overseas applicants. So that's the discussion we're going to be taking off in just a few minutes. Please stay with us. We will be right back. Hello and welcome back. Here we are in our first panel around green mobility and geographical balance. I have a full house of panelists here to introduce you to. I have the great pleasure, let me start, with Marie Lussaud. She is the Secretary General of On The Move, the cultural mobility network active in Europe and worldwide. We also have Oksana sarsevska kravchenko She is the director of the Isolatia Foundation, which is a platform for cultural initiatives established in 2010 in a former insulation materials factory in Donetsk in the Ukraine. Oksana has brought with her Michalio Globocki. He is also from Isolatia, and he has, in addition, since 2020, been a board member of one of the oldest European networks of cultural centers, in uh, which is Trans Europe Halles. And finally, let me introduce Dia Vidovic. She is the director of the Cultura Nova Foundation, a public foundation dedicated to civil society organizations in contemporary arts and culture in Croatia. Culture Novo, no, excuse me, Culture Novo, 
Cultura Nova, is what I'm trying to say, is also a partner of the consortium in charge of the Ipertunus Houses project. That's headed by the European Cultural Foundation, supporting host organizations to provide efficient residencies and working environments. So we have all the experts at the table. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Dea, you were the last to introduce and I messed up your introduction, so I'm going to start with you and give you some airtime there to save that. When we discuss with the consortium how to make a mobility screen scheme green, lots of different recommendations come up. People talk about how we need to give preference to applicants who are traveling with a low carbon means, or to allocate extra budget for people who want to travel by train, or to create a CO2 compensation fund. There's lots of ideas in the room. So what do you think is the best way to achieve this? What is your opinion there? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, hello to everyone. Good day to everyone. Thanks also to organizer for uh, having me today as a representative of another consortium of three partners, European Cultural Foundation, MITOS and Cultura Nova Foundation that implement mobility grants here within the e Houses project. But to come back, Corey, to your questions, uh, so, although the sustainable mobility includes really different uh, aspects of uh, eco-friendly behavior and act, talking about uh, sustainable travel often implies the climate impact of aviation and exploring traveling by other means, which is not always possible if it refers to international travel between two distant parts or simply includes those parts of Europe where other types of reliable transport are not developed at all. So in that line, my first message or requirement will be the urgency of developing sustainable aviation fuel and also European equally investment across Europe in developing a greener, quieter and more energy efficient railway network and other types of eco-friendly transportation. And it would be also in line of what we took earlier and heard from the commissioner about the synergy between a different sector. But while waiting for environmentally friendly travel opportunities and decarbonization of transport, and instead of taking a radical approach of giving up of long traveling and flying altogether, and also taking into account that international mobility is an important aspect of contemporary arts creation, production and distribution. One of the bigger preoccupation of artists and cultural professionals today became imagination of ecological alternatives and more sustainable options and implementation of new concepts of sustainable travel. Of course, it is also reasonable to immediately take a critical look at this approach and to consider such changes merely as a cosmetic, satisfying only political corrections. However, besides everything you mentioned earlier, we can also consider, for example, different kinds of the concepts, such as the concept of circle travel, meaningful travel, or slow travel. So what is behind all that concept? For example, the concept of circle travel means that the trip is conducted in a continuous and a circular route where the point of origin is also the ultimate destination but it's not a round trip because it involves more than one stopover that is in a line with avoiding a back and forth style of traveling. It could work uh, for touring in a different art fields and in that way, time of traveling and ambition reduce. As a curator and researcher, Taru Alfing underlines, slow travel encourage less traveling, but making more out of the journey. At the same time, slow traveling requires a radical sense of time and space. It refers to getting back in touch with the surroundings while traveling by train or combining with other forms of eco-friendly transportation. And this concept takes more time for the journey itself and implies stops on the route to visit, for example, exhibitions or any other cultural events, to meet friends and colleagues and so on and so on. 
At the other side, the meaningful traveling refers to international travel between two distant parts. It implies improving the value of mobility through a longer stay, for example, at the destination, increasing the number of artist performances, deeper engagement with the local community, and many, many different things. So to implement any of those overlapping, I would say, and interconnected concept, it's really necessary to change the approach to mobility and the cultural system in general and to provide the relevant and adequate funding opportunities and most importantly, uh, equal access to all. So I think that it's enough for the beginning. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much for that very detailed answer. <clears throat> I saw that the rest of the panelists were nodding very enthusiastically at what you were saying, which is a very good sign. I want to come now to Marie. Marie, you, you actually wrote a paper about global mobility about 10 years ago. So this is not a trend. This is not new. What about these concepts of circular travel and everything that Dia just mentioned? Do you agree? Is this something that you thought about before? What's, what's the, the position there? Thank you, and uh, thank you very much, Corey, and thank you already to Dea and uh, later to Ikelo and uh, Oksana uh, to be part also of this conversation. Um, indeed, you, you mentioned one, uh, one document that we co-produced uh, already 10 years ago, I mean, uh, which was called the Green Mobility Guide for the Performing Arts Sector. And it was in collaboration with Julie's Bicycle. I mean, at that time, not so many organizations were talking about the issue, or it was a bit more you know, confined to some uh, discussions. So it's, it's very good to see at least that, you know, also because of, of the urgency of the climate crisis and also all the, you know, the context of the pandemic, which exacerbated some many discussion about the subject, um, so that this issue is very uh, coming back in the discussion. Um, I, I guess you know, like the different um, uh, how to say examples that were provided by there. I mean, they they are all interesting to be experimented eventually in the next mobility funding scheme, being for iPortunus or for other mobility funding scheme. We, we still need to experiment uh, this uh, format because there is really a need of paradigm shift in the way we support mobility uh, in terms of duration, in terms of what is produced also at the end of the mobility. We focus very much always on the travel, but what is interesting is what is done at the end and, and, and the very value. You know, um, I will quote uh, one artist uh, in, in a recent conversation about that, and he say, my project has more value than my CO2. And I think it doesn't mean that this artist doesn't um, care about environmental sustainability, but it's more like, um, also to, to remind the fact that until now, because as they was saying, we have to see the long term and what can be changed, not only in our sector, but in other sectors as well. Um, but very much now, I, I also would like to remember, to remind us that very much of the pressure is put on artists and cultural professionals on this particular issue, you know. Uh, basically, we have to tick boxes on the means of transportation, but with that, there is not particular funding incentive, for instance, or sometimes there is not a full understanding of the context and maybe some priority needs as well. And this is something that I think we are all aware of, but which is very important to take into consideration because also um, many artists and cultural professionals are living also in a very precarious condition, which is even more exacerbated now with the pandemic. So we have also like to bear that in mind. Um, and uh, I would like also to remind us, um, it was very much said also before about how a mobility funding scheme like iPortunus answered the need of the sector of individual artists and cultural professionals. And out of this need as well, there is also an economic necessity very often. So for many artists and cultural professionals, Travel is not only, or oh, to go in another country is not only a choice, it's also out of an economic necessity because you don't have the support for your training, you don't have the market enough to develop your practice, you don't have support for your artistic discipline. So this is also very important to keep in mind. So here I know that I am not bringing a new solution, but maybe some aspect to take into consideration when we experiment some form of paradigm shift in the way we support mobility. And, and I would like to, to add also maybe another point as well. Uh, you mentioned about this green mobility guide for the performing arts sector. So 10 years after what has happened, what is very interesting is that 
we can see that there are many initiatives, be it from the sector, from organizations, to try to deal with this issue and also on the, at the level of mobility. But as far as the new uh, form of mobility funding scheme is concerned, it's still very few. Uh, but it's quite interesting to look at them on how they try to take into consideration the very notion what uh, Dea was mentioning, the question of duration. So if you stay longer in, a, in another place, for instance, the kind of impact it has also on your personal life. And it, does it really also fit your needs as well? So all these questions has, have to be taken into, concern, in, into consideration in relation with funding support, in relation and how funding is allocated, depending on context. And I think our colleague from Ukraine also will come back on that. Uh, on the question of, so I say, funding, on the question of access to training and mentoring as well, and the question of access to resource. We have seen an increased um, you know, number of guides and resources, but they are not always well disseminated or they are not always well contextualized, I would say. It's not the same thing to take into consideration you know, this question, let's say, in a more Western part of Europe or well-connected country compared with other parts of Europe as well, or creative Europe country for the matter. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Marie. That's a great segue to come over to our, our colleagues here from Isolatia. Let's talk about these further barriers for people specifically coming from non-EU countries or from overseas areas. There are a myriad of further challenges that we should be considering with this focus on green mobility, is there not? Um, hello. Um, speak, um, Oksana Sajewska Kravchenko, Director of Isolatia. Yeah, I would like to say uh, a lot of thanks to already um, uh, all spoken because uh, what Dia so, uh, talked to, to us and to Marie, it already covers a lot of uh, points uh, towards the question of uh, mobility and uh, from a uh, very big distance as well. But uh, speaking about uh, the uh, real um, situations, what we have, for, uh, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, uh, during our practice uh, for Iportunus in two seasons, we have a lot of uh, uh, broad coverage for all of the countries, and we have the um, participants, I mean applicants, who participated in uh, the mobility and uh, were from overseas uh, territories as well. But speaking about green mobility and slow mobility, it is a good point to good uh, explanation, not to uh, uh, exclude the participants from these territories uh, who has uh, only flight uh, connections, uh, not to apply to opportunities, because the strongest uh, what we have uh, for this program is the flexibility the open mind, minds uh, and uh, the easy uh, application. So, and we encourage a lot uh, of the applicants to apply. And now it's uh, our task, I mean, for now the consortia and uh, for other implementators to explain how to achieve this green balance or how to use this uh, environment approach in the trails in between the countries. And uh, I would like to invite to the panel uh, Mikhailo, who can uh, help me with um, some samples of uh, international uh, uh, travels as well. Misha. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Oksana. Um, and I'm also really grateful to a lot of great words already and great ideas. It's It's really inspiring um one of the most inspiring thing for me from this year's hypertunus uh, project was actually a number of uh, travels that were made outside of um, european union and that uh, has to do with for example uh, eastern partnership countries um, and this was a really big change especially because you know traditionally these countries don't have really nice connection uh, don't have a lot of cultural projects, and a lot of them actually suffered from recent conflicts and wars. So 
some of the projects that we supported has had actually a lot of implementation and urgency about topics that they were speaking about. So, and this uh, projects of course couldn't be possible without the iPartner support in one hand, but on the other hand, it wasn't be possible to to make them as green as we would like to, to have them, especially if we are speaking about places like Armenia, for example, which are really far away if you travel um, all across across the Europe. Um, so um, this this made a lot of change for the, for the program, and I think this is something that should should be uh, carried on. Um, and um, but for places where we can have some more sustainable approach to use less um, uh, dirty transport, less airplanes, um, to to use more trains. Of course, we should make sure that people are aware about this fact and and the fact that iPartners has been really easy to apply for and you know as not as uh, bureaucratic as um, as a lot of other programs um, had been a big advantage advantage to the program so um, for us now it's a big challenge to make the the green aspect of of the program also as easy and um, uh, useful as other aspects of of of, uh, of applications brilliant oksana you've raised your hand is there something you'd like to add to that uh yeah i would like uh, additionally that speaking about uh, environment sustainability and green mobility we need to, uh to keep in the focus uh, the uh, inclusivity diversity and accessibility uh, as well because like uh, we, we can't uh, only be focused on one aspect because all is extra connected and speaking about inclusivity this is like contribution to what Misha said that we need to uh, understand that sometimes people can't uh, make uh, uh, slow mobility for instance uh, speaking about disabled people or speaking about uh, uh, artists and culture professionals uh, with uh, some uh, family um, like uh uh abilities for instance with babies or with adults uh, uh, on their uh, uh, super, uh, uh, for, uh, for whom they need to take care as well and sometimes uh, artists and cultural professional professionals need to have like fast mobility or speaking about uh, other sectors like not only performing arts uh, or visual arts like for instance music uh, in this case, uh, if we are give uh, a lot of like freedom, I mean, for our applicants uh, to make uh, the shows or to present their works, sometimes it's up to uh, great uh, need to come from one to another country. Of course, we need to promote the uh, green attitude, but this is why uh, we have for just now this panel. This is why we uh, have. Uh, uh, in this year, two discussions with a lot of professionals and uh, culture actors uh, uh, speaking about how to be real practical, not only dreaming about uh, like uh, on a long term, and this is extra important, but uh, speaking on sh uh, short term, uh, realizing and how to be practical with hypertunnels. All this need to be considered. And it seems that Somehow we found some um, solutions. Maybe uh, uh, we can share this in the recommendations a bit further a bit, uh, from our consortia and from consortia from uh, uh, houses as well. And uh, we can try to do our best to show in the best practices as well. That's great, Oksana. Thank you. That's a really relevant point to consider about inclusion and making sure we're not excluding any artists from different areas with different lifestyles and different families. Um, I want to just, we do have the second panel that will focus a bit deeper on the inclusivity aspect, but I want to come here, I'll come back to you, Dea. We are talking a lot about the individual actions of the artists. We're saying how they travel and what practices they have in their, in their practices or in their art. What about the host organizations? Do they not play a vital role here? What should we be requesting or encouraging the host organizations to do? 
Um, thank you so much for this uh, uh, questioning and uh, the, this question and emphasizing the role of a uh, uh, host uh, within the mobility of artists and cultural professionals. I think that it's really, really important to, to understand that mobility doesn't mean only traveling or moving from point A to point B. It is a process that consists of many different aspects at the destination in which the host plays a crucial, really crucial role as the one who should be accountable and attentive in providing sustainable and adequate condition for work and life of artists and cultural professionals. So there are complex interdependencies between artists and host that have deep implications on mobility experiences at the destination. So hosts are shaping the institution of mobility of artists and cultural professionals. And in that line, the support for hosts requires wider transformation, firstly, in recognizing the importance of their role, and secondly, with the increasing the amount of financing for building strong mobility infrastructure, because the, uh, the choose which made by uh, uh, Host in a, also in the context of sustainability could be really, really crucial and could also impact the uh, sustainable mobility. So from all that, uh, for all those reasons, which I mentioned in our Epotenus uh, Houses project consortium, we decided to provide the grants to artists and cultural professionals for mobility via host. So in that way, hosts are included in the mobility project from the beginning, providing also support to artists and cultural professionals in preparing their proposal. So the first data, for example, of our research show us exactly the need for stronger role of hosts in the future mobility that include providing a more than invitation letter, supporting preparation period uh, in the writing project proposal, for example, assistant in work, research, production, and hospitality, having members of the host team available for any issues or problems, enabling artists uh, and cultural professionals to better understand their audiences on the destination, more contacts with the local artists, and many, many, many other things, or just a quote one of the respondents who summarized all of that in one really, really simple formula to be a real host. So this is what is really, really important to, to think about and to find uh, also a way and different kind of the criteria to implement in the future grant scheme for the mobility. Corey, over to you. Thank you very much. I want to pass back to the rest of the panelists. I saw a lot of nodding, a lot of reflective looks. Do you have any other comments or anything else you'd like to add to Dea's very thorough answer? Uh, may I step in? Uh, so uh, from uh, my uh, side, like uh, Isolatse representative, uh, when we are working with residences uh, uh, more than 10 years, of course, I totally agree with uh, Dia uh, that the role of the host is extra crucial uh, when we are talking about uh, like uh, providing help, support to our uh, residents. But I'm trying here to be more open and more uh, might uh, viewing because uh, we, we can't unfortunately uh, only to have a look on residents who, uh, for instance, have the uh, production oriented residency. Uh, coming a step uh, out of the uh, residencies for production, for instance, uh, or research, uh, and uh, having a look on emerging artists or artists in uh, music sphere or uh, independent curators who uh, need to be uh, as uh, like free as they need. So in this case, hosts can uh, play a less role. I don't uh, say that hosts are not <laughs> needed. Of course, they are, but hosts can play less role. And uh, uh, in this case, we need maybe speaking opportunities to support as well uh, uh, artists and culture professionals with additional information, like giving the toolkits, like uh, uh, giving the possibility uh, for independent uh, culture actors to have a look 
uh, how they can uh, be more independent as uh, independent artists or culture uh, professionals uh, and trying to create their, uh, their mobility uh, more environmental, more um, uh, better. And uh, in this case, like for like, uh, additional aspect, maybe we need to think about how to uh, provide already on the uh, iCortunus platform additional information uh, for independent uh, uh, artists and culture professionals uh, who need less uh, um, uh, like um, uh, uh, support from hosts. But of course, I totally agree that hosts play a lot of uh, a big role uh, for um, sharing and uh, providing additional knowledge to artists who take, uh, who participate in the residences, who participate in the programs, because only like um, standards, uh, what are using uh, during this uh, uh, working with the host can be like uh, already included in the practice of the uh, culture uh, professionals. So maybe, uh, Marie, you can add something as well. Maybe just to, beyond this question of um, focus on host organization and focus on artists and cultural professional, I think one of the challenge also this question um, about environmental sustainability and, and mobility and, and the support is that we are now in a really in the era of the need of experimentation of the, of, the, of the new model. So that's why, but what is very important is that we are very much aware of if we take a decision in a particular context, it may have some negative impact if we apply the same decision in other contexts as well. Um, so maybe we are also in this era of uh, a more contextualized approach. I mean, we can have, for instance, a more global um, mobility funding scheme, like the one of iPortunus, for instance, but there are also other. We have also this cross-regional, cross-border country type of approach, but also with some um, more contextualized or even decentralized way to apply this mobility funding scheme still very much based on the needs uh, of the sector. And I think it was very much said um, from the beginning of this talk. Uh, of course, it was said also like from the different partner of the consortium, but I think this is also a very much added value of this program, of this iPortunus program. The fact that it's still very much based on the needs of the sector and the need should also encompass based on context. This question of environmental sustainability or inclusion accessibility. So we are almost in this tailor-made type of approach part of a bigger project to continue to support mobility because as mentioned there are many needs out of there and particularly for many artists it's a matter of survival sometimes like to connect to other countries to further develop their work and it's also part of the sustainability of their practice because otherwise they may lose opportunities they may lose job opportunities and contact and further collaboration to continue to work in their own sector. Dea, I saw you raise your digital hand and I'll come straight to you. I just want to remind the audience at this stage, we only have about 10 minutes left for this panel discussion. So now's your chance to ask your questions on the hop-in tool. Don't forget about that. I'll let you do that furiously in the background and hand straight back over to you, Dea. You had a point that you wanted to share with us. Just really, really shortly, I, I, I really don't want to take uh, uh, too much time, uh, but I have to react that uh, when I talk about the cost, I didn't uh, mean only on a residency program, then on different kind of the festivals, conferences, uh, research, uh, research purposes. So in all that uh, aspect, the role of the host, it's important and has a really specific role, depends, of course, on the context and depends on the interest and needs and the motivation of artists, cultural professionals, but also the uh, host itself. And I will finish here uh, to, to give us more opportunity to discuss some other aspects as well. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, I want to change the, the kilter a little bit. I want to ask you all... Johannes made a slight reference earlier that a future mobility scheme could involve a hybrid element or some kind of digital element. That's something that would, they would consider for the future. Now, we have all been relying heavily 
on digital tools over the pandemic. They become irreplaceable in our day to day work. Do you think using digital communication technologies can help mobility become more sustainable? I'll start with you, Michalio. What do you think about that? Thank you. Um, we discuss this question a lot, uh, and we'll actually have this, one of the panels about uh, digital mobility later. Um, but um, we saw a lot of great examples of people using digital mobilities for things we haven't thought about before, and it's, it's especially connected with COVID pandemics, obviously, when people couldn't travel, so they had to replace it. And um, we thought about different um, uh, scenarios when people can use digital mobilities to enhance their uh, standard mobility, and, and actually this can make it more greener and sustainable. For example, eliminated some, eliminating some of the arms of their travel or making mobility smaller or uh, making uh, preliminary meetings and negotiations, seeing the places, uh, making researches online. This all uh, gives a lot of opportunities for uh, mobility to become greener and, and easier. How do the others feel about this? Uh, I only, uh, yeah, this, uh, the sound, sound uh, seems okay. Uh, I feel that, yeah, of course, uh, this aspect uh, that we can input uh, the digital aspect to the mobility uh, can uh, make uh, all the uh, program of mobility uh, much better. This uh, year, I mean, uh, 2021 shows us uh, that really a lot of preparing phase were done before the real uh, mobility was uh, implemented, especially talking about changing of the dates and changing even sometimes the destinations. And of course, uh, like speaking about sustainability, uh, definitely it already shows that in the time of uh, un um, clear situation with the pandemic, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, limitation inside the countries uh, due to the uh, COVID. Uh, we need to prove that a uh, real start of the mobility uh, should be on that or these dates and only using like, uh, like uh, first uh, preparing meeting or uh, preparing uh, the real uh, mobility. It, it is already uh, on a top place, like it's it's a real necessity. And of course, speaking about like a uh, uh, green aspect, like adding the possibility to the uh, mobility, like to be a part in a digital format gives a um, uh, additional aspect of how to uh, be more uh, mind thankful uh, on a mobility. It's about more careful approach. Uh, did I really need to spend this or that time during the mobility? So it, it gives more um, like think about uh, uh, mobility. And yes, I know that a lot of uh, artists are using just now uh, different tools, uh, how to start, how to collaborate. It's not only about like Zoom meetings or chatting. Uh, it's more about different uh, like real digital tools which can be used for musicians even for architects how to create uh, uh, one uh, for instance uh, drawing being in different places so it gives a uh, um, different approach uh, to mobility to the meetings and of course it should be considered uh, into the future schemes as well absolutely i think it's such a relevant point to say does this need to be a flight or could this be done online? But also the aspect, the beautiful aspect of having hosting an online community. We never want to jeopardize the mobility aspect. People should travel. We heard time and again earlier about the sense of belonging and the value that traveling brings, but also providing a digital element might balance that and give another sense of belonging, belonging on an online sphere. It's a very interesting discussion to have. I know that this is something that Marie and I talked about in advance um, of the of the event today, where we just don't ever want digital to replace travel. Yes, we can be more mindful, as Oksana said, but don't think that we can solve it with digital. That's really the your key message, isn't it, Marie? Yes, to a, to a, to a large extent, but I don't think it's only my key message. <laughs> People also are, are thinking about that, but the, 
I mean, we have also to, to take some positive learning of this pandemic, which is uh, still unfortunate that is not ended yet, but um, it's, it's also like um, really in a very short period of time, like the critical mass of experimentation that we could have, you know, online and somehow that connect to the real format or on-site format of mobility to connect, to develop work, to develop collaboration and so on. But at the same time, on this digital world, we are also reproducing, you know, like inequality, inequality of access towards uh, the internet, for instance. Um, there is also an environmental impact of what we are doing digitally, uh, even though it's still very difficult to calculate it, but there is definitely an impact on that and also on all the streaming, for instance, uh, use of, of, um, um, of, um, of, the, of the web and, um, and also um, the inequality of funding as well, because many things is happening in terms of swap creation on the web, but very uh, rarely, in fact, there is some kind of economic model behind it. I mean, there are a lot of initiatives, but they are not paid for the artist and cultural professional. And the same goes with founder, you know, um, on, on the Move website, for instance, for the past two years now, we have this new country online, you know, like online opportunities for residency and so on. So we only put paid residency or paid opportunities, even if they are online, for instance. But behind this online, we find the same type of funders. So in fact, on the online world, we have also this inequality of access to funding, depending on where you are located still in the world. And I just would like also to add that on this digital, um, digital should be also, again, a, a question of choice. And sometimes people don't have the choice or not to travel and and it's the same for digital and it should not be also used and as an excuse i mean we hear that also more and more um that you know sometimes people are not granted a visa or authorization to go uh, to a particular country and people say oh but you know like uh, oh, i mean some authorities will say to the artist or cultural professional but it's okay because now you can do your project online so there is also you know, like uh, this uh, challenge also like to take into consideration. Definitely. Thank you very much for those thoughts. I think that's really, really valid to say that it's not it's not so so clear how a digital can affect us, but thank you very much. I have one last question for you before I move on to the, the audience questions. Maybe a, quite a bold question for you. Can Ipertunus be the agent of change in green, green mobility in Europe and beyond? We have fantastic minds working on this, thinking on this. Can Ipertunus be that change agent? Do you think this is what could happen? I'll start, I see Michalia was nodding enthusiastically. I'll start with you and then we'll open up to the rest. Thank you. Well, yeah, Ipertunus uh, has to become the main uh, program for mobility of Creative Europe, obviously. And uh, with its coverage of all the countries, all the artists, all the... Um, hosting organization that we were talking about, um, it has the tremendous amount of communication channels to bring knowledge about the green mobility, about the ways uh, of sustainable um, travel. And we just cannot afford ourselves not to use this opportunity to spread the word and to become uh, the central point that actually um, uh, makes people think about this green mobility and, and green mobility that doesn't have to be something special you know it's not something that we should discuss actually you know this just has to be in our minds and you know it's just your first thought how should I travel obviously it's a train it's not a plane you know obviously I will you know use this greener transport because everyone knows that it's good it's not something some special thing that we have to write in the, in our uh, grant application to make it better you know so th this kind of thinking is something that we should um, make people uh, think and to change their minds to make um, this green sustainable mobility just a normal thing and uh, not in, in you know in in close future not to talk about it anymore but just to take it for granted thank you oksana you have raised your hand please at, we're, we're coming to the very end but if you could just briefly share your points that would be fantastic uh, 
people heard uh, about that Alpertunus, it's a great program for inspiring uh, emerging and experienced artists and giving the, a lot of opportunities. And that's why it's a, a better ambassador uh, about uh, green mobility as well, because having a lot of uh, fantastic uh, samples uh, from our uh, already um, uh, uh, finished grantees and about the experience we can promote and show the best practices about green mobility uh, uh, and uh, this can be like inspiring elements uh, for, for future and for the next people so from my side it's all thank you Dea yeah I also want to add something to this uh, and I really think that if we want to make changes within the future of grand scheme of mobility also with an e portness it's really necessary to make a systemic change that will cover all problematic aspects, traditional and new impediments. So to increase the budget for the mobility is not enough. To increase grants for mobility is also not enough. Or to provide the systemic support for hosts is also not enough. Or to change award criteria considering inequality of access and emission inequality also is not enough. So to create more opportunities for engagement with the local community is not enough. To reduce emission while traveling is not enough and so on and so on. So it's obviously that uh, the issue of sustainability and access became the most important issue of our time, but those issues require like really many, many other things, a holistic approach, engagement within many sector. And it's also necessary to take into account the inequality of access and an emission inequality across the world, as well as the European territory. And in that sense, to repeat again, that it's really, really important to think always about the context and to provide a different tailor-made opportunity and the possibility. Thank you very much, Marie. You can add the closing remarks to this question. I will very much echo also to what was said before. And so, uh, Patrice, some of the wording also just used uh, by Dea on this holistic approach to have and um, a connected uh, approach. And also to connect with another word which was said before by the Commissioner Maria Gabriel, this question of synergy. Synergy within our sector to support even more mobility of artists and cultural professionals, but differently, you know, to comply with all the criteria that we mentioned. Synergy as well with other sectors, because we cannot do very much at an individual level, but there is really a systemic change that needs to be a bit more uh, global. And I would say also like to add, um, also, like uh, um, if we look really much at this question of mobility funding program, more connection also between them, because a lot of interesting experimentation, we talk a lot about experimentation, flexibility, telemade adaptation. These are also some of the key learning of the pandemic. And hopefully, even with bigger institutions, bigger structure, we could see that they could really much adapt also to the context. So to continue to work uh, on that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all. Because I did make an extra scene about the, the audience questions, I will slip in just one. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the others, but we'll come back to them. Very briefly, Christian Schnack has asked, should opportunists demand green traveling or rather offer specific incentives such as financial or applicants who travel green to get an incentive? What do you think? Anybody can answer this one. Michalo, you were nodding. Should they demand green travel or just merely offer incentives? Oh, I, I, will, I will give the microphone to Oksana because she, yeah. she's ready to say something. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, Ipartonos need to give a possibility of uh, thinking uh, for the artist and making uh, its uh, own choice, uh, uh, her or he, uh, how to travel. Of course, we can't limit uh, the freedom of the choice how to travel, but uh, we can give uh, the samples of the best practices how to make a green mobility. We can uh, inspire to be more uh, e um, ecology friendly in the aspect of the travel. And uh, yeah, only like uh, step by step, it can be implemented by the uh, applicants as well. But definitely it's not about the limitation. 
Yeah, I, I, I also want to, to repeat what Marie uh, uh, already shared with us, that really ongoing changes in our contemporary society and this ecological urgency are completely affecting the field of arts and culture as well as well as the professional practices of mobility. So we basically have to consider sustainability on a wider scale than through the lenses of a carbon ambition. So it is interconnected to economy and geopolitics, instrumentalization of art, model of economy, logical financing, and this unstable working condition within the arts and culture that are related to to unequal access to the variety of opportunities. So considering traveling as an inherent part of international circulation and career development in arts and culture, show us how the mobility is important today for the cultural sector. But the questions such as uh, how to, uh, who has access to the internet or who has access to information, who has access to funding or who has access uh, uh, or condition to reduce ecological uh, footprint or who is in the position to give up for traveling is something what is really, really crucial to take into consideration when it's a created the future uh, grant scheme, uh, scheme for the mobility. So this is what I wanted really to repeat and to, to always remind us that it's a necessity of thinking on different scale while, as I said earlier, waiting for this uh, uh, ecological friendly transportation. Oksana, I'm so sorry. I've seen you've raised your hand, but we're really out of time. Can you make it really, really quick? Or should we skip? I will be extra quick. Uh, I uh, will uh, only add to Dia that definitely uh, uh, our grantees, like uh, I will be uh, uh, saying about samples of 2021, uh, they show already the uh, sustainable uh, approach uh, to the mobility because, yeah, uh, uh, despite we have uh, 70, uh, 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 75 uh, percentage of uh, uh, flights, uh, those we have uh, more than 87% uh, of our applicants who already um, indicated they, they integrated other aspects of our uh, um, uh, ecological um, attitude to their project. So it's already a good trend, I guess. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> all so much for your time as you can see we could talk about this all day thank you for joining us that was a really inspiring discussion for the rest of you in the audience thank you for your patience we are a little bit over time but we'll catch it on up in just a few minutes we'll be moving on to our second panel discussion which is all about inclusion and Dea gave us a lovely bit of input there about accessibility that's exactly what we're going to come to now so thank you for the segue Dea again huge thanks to the panelists and if you stay with us we'll be back in just a few minutes thank you Hello and welcome back to our second panel discussion all around inclusion. And as I mentioned just before the break, we have a real focus here on accessibility and diversity. And that's why I've got a fantastic panel joining me here on the screen. Let me introduce you to our three panelists, beginning with Odette Brady. Odette is an arts organizer and director of Cel del Nord residency in Spain. Cell del Nord works to provide opportunities for artists along, alongside the realities of everyday life. Chloé Fricou is head of the Residencies Division at Institut Français. Between 2018 and 2021, she was Vice President of Arts en Residence, apologies for the French accent, Chloé, a French-based national network gathering residency programs and structures. And finally, we also have Fariba Mosley. She is a cultural manager, curator, and cultural anthropologist in Austria. She is the founder and head of Studio One, an association for art and culture projects. And she currently works as deputy artistic director of art social space in Vienna in Austria. 
Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and for being patient. We are a few minutes over time. It's great to have you here. I'm going to start with you, Fariba. First of all, thank you especially, Fariba. You jumped into this panel just yesterday afternoon because we did have a cancellation. So thank you first and foremost for your huge flexibility. It's great to have you here. Maybe we can just start with understanding a bit more about this term inclusion. What do we really mean when we're talking about inclusion, especially with regards to the cultural sector? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to jump into this discussion. Um, and I also had the pleasure to follow the, the former discussion where we are also can yeah uh, start on now. Um, well, I, ha I um, have to confess that with the term inclusion itself, I, um, I try to avoid it in, in my work and also in my work at uh, Brunnen Passage in Vienna. So I'm working there uh, uh, in a former market hall in the longest street market of Europe. And in this neighborhood uh, where we are working with, with the neighborhood as well, of course, not only um, in a very transcultural field uh, on and with the topic of diversity on a daily basis. So you have this neighborhood where all of Europe uh, is represented in a nutshell. And the term inclusion for us in our work it is something like uh, proposing to, to including something which is into into a system to, into an existing system which uh, is not part of it yet. And we way more like to work on the transformation of the system itself. So on the structures of the cultural system. So as the starting point for our approach, working on the topic of diversity is kind of like this paradigm shift we are facing in the established cultural sector. Uh, all over Europe, we have diverse and very heterogeneous societies and the cultural sector is reinforcing and reproducing exclusion. Um, concerning diversity and is uh, so do residency and mobility programs, I would say. So how can we come up uh, with sociopolitical living realities, uh, how to represent them in, in the field of arts? So um, trying especially to start to stay changing structures, stay changing teams, asking ourselves how a our team uh, funding system uh, are consisted of and then in uh, yeah, leading to the artists themselves with, with uh, which artists are we working and how to make it accessible. So, but um, yeah, so as a starting, but this is kind of my access uh, to the topic. So um, the importance of reflecting um, living realities of our society within the arts and this, uh, yeah, as the arts are reproducing exclusion a lot, so. I'll pass over now to Chloe. I mean, as part of the consortium, you have been involved in many discussions and chats about keeping this program, the Opportunist program, as accessible as possible. And I know that you've done some particular work to um, make it more accessible for people with disabilities. Could you share a little bit more about that, perhaps, and let us know what the what Opportunist has been doing thus far to try and be accessible and inclusive? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Corey, for the invitation and for inviting me as a representative of the Hypotenuse Consortium. Um, for, during those two years, the Hypotenuse Consortium works a lot on inclusion since it's one of the main topics of, uh, of the program. Um, regarding regarding um, how to include people and artists and cultural professionals with disability, um, in the last year, we have uh, for the for the last version of Iportunus, we have selected three applications of artists with disability. So I will directly go to concrete uh, answer that the consortium um, gave to that. At at, the, at this moment, we propose them if needed. Uh, to double their travel budget and to cover possible additional costs they will have. I'm thinking about uh, extra nights to recover from travel or maybe taxi uh, for people who cannot take uh, public transport. So um, this was our answer until now to um, include people with disability in, in the project. Now in the future, what we suggest also in the policy recommendation is that the scheme should address the needs of person living with disability, but not 
on not only in a um, financial point of view, but really end to end. Um, I'm thinking about uh, we we recommend to develop a fully accessible website. Maybe we we'll go back to this uh, to this point later. But really, um, to have different parameters to make um, much people as possible. Um, uh, I, that they have access to this website. Also, um, we are thinking about allowing for multimedia application, maybe to only have written application, it's not the best way to include people. Maybe we should, we should think about um, video uh, capsule or maybe a spoken application too. Uh, also, we, we, we recommend to identify accessible hosts. We talk a lot in the, in the former panel, you talk a lot, uh, a lot about uh, be, uh, individual beneficiary and host. Um, maybe we should have a database with hosts and point uh, the one who are fully equipped and um, have the, the capacity to welcome uh, artists and cultural professionals with disability. So this idea is really, um, we really try to work a lot on, on, this, uh, on this first uh, part of inclusion, I will say, the, the people with disability and to really include it in all the, the aspects of the program. And along through the network, not just for the, for the end user, so to speak, the artist, but also for hosts. That's really interesting. I'm going to come to you now, Odette, because I know that we had a small conversation about this beforehand. Um, yes. We've heard as well in the previous panel that there are big financial implications when it comes to joining a residency. We heard that some people are very attracted to do residencies because that's an opportunity to make money and be supported and be funded. But on the other hand, some people are leaving their full-time jobs behind, perhaps, to be able to join a residency. What do yeah. you think about being f inclusive to various socio-demographics to make sure that we're really not... We heard as well that 48%, I think, of, it was, of the artists are earning less than 10,000 euros a year. I mean, that's... That says it all, does it? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think um, just to explain where I'm coming from, um, I work at Cell Del Nord, which is an in-person residency. But at the beginning of the pandemic, we started running a digital program, entirely digital because nobody could travel. Um, and um, were stunned by the number of people who were cheering and clapping and saying this is the first time I've ever been able to do a residency because I can't um you know my experience of mobility is just zero because I can't I can't move from my um my job or my family I can't get somebody to look after my kids um and I think that when we talk about mobility there's always an assumption that um the the first hurdle is to is to get the person from one place to another but actually just allowing the person to leave um whatever their reality is 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 huge and i think fariba you talked about this um idea of um recreating inequalities and you know if if most of the artists that we're talking about are actually doing a job which doesn't pay them enough to take holiday maybe they are working in a kind of gig style um job then you know maybe that's our first hurdle and not um, kind of getting them from A to B to C or wherever. Yeah. Freeba, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so we, we, in this case, we are kind of ending up who can afford to go on a residences. And when, I think the last two decades uh, have been kind of the decades of, of artists in residence. And I, I have also been on residences and uh, as a, uh, more as a curator and so on. It's, yeah, it's depending on financial background, but also language backgrounds and uh, um, political backgrounds as well. I would say you have job obligations probably, but who uh, um, besides the financial barriers, but also um, the the legal status of your of your visa, um, and may, you may live maybe in Austria, but you don't have an Austrian citizenship. You may maybe not get a, uh, a visa for going uh, to a certain country. So citizenship and also this, uh, yeah, um, residency uh, mobility be, being based, also the applications on on this na nation state level uh, can be quite uh, difficult and a, a great barrier. As a, a barrier. Um, there have been developed uh, so like information platforms uh, already. I don't. 
it's individually how it is accessible, but it, there is a need. Like I mean, in Austria, we have something like called like smart mobility, where you can uh, inf um, get information about uh, tax questions or uh, visa questions, uh, um, uh, question of law concerning traveling, etc. But still, it's the fact that the art and the visual art are still continuing to be very exclusive. Yeah. So the topic of diversity is meanwhile kind of came into the mainstream, but uh, you see, yes, you see artists from underrepresented groups uh, um, in all genres of the art, but in, in what intensity and who, what are again, the background of these artists and I always ask myself, is the topic already structurally kind of established within the, within the system? So it's not only that we take one here and one there, but uh, who of us is working in uh, big institutions where the board of uh, members or the directors, the leading team, the management team is uh, reflecting and representing our the, so that society's diversity. And therefore, it's really a need to, to strange the structures and the um, accessibility concerning all these various, which we have uh, uh, stated before, the financial one, political one, etc. So this necessity is uh, extremely important. And what I've learned also from my work is as far as you start kind of diversifying the team you're working in, um, your colleagues and uh, like the, the boards, the juries, the people who are in the selecting uh, processes and also of course, uh, it ends up in a, a way more diverse um, group of artists you're working in. The stories you're telling are changing. Who is speaking is changing. And these are the very important parameters, I think. And uh, can, yeah, maybe someone else will add something. It's a beautiful point. I think it's such an important point. And when we talk about the idea of quotas, quite often people use this as the argument against quotas by saying, you do not need a quota if you have a representative group of people on the selection committee in the European Parliament reflecting societal diversity. It's often a very large argument for this and maybe we're not quite there yet. I'd love to ask the other two panelists if they have an opinion on this. Do you think that quotas are a good idea? And do you agree with Fariba's point about just having more diversity? I'm sure you do, that's a stupid question. Just how do you feel about quotas? I'll start with you again, Odette. Um, I think that quotas are a s very slippery slope towards um, different um, the, the the minute marginalisation of people who don't um, fit into wh whichever quota um, the people who are already in um, the high positions haven't recognised yet. So, you know, if you are not in a a, a diverse um, if you're not being run by a diverse group of people as an organization and you're deciding within that um, that you know that board oh these are the groups that we need to add quotas to if there's pretty much a hundred percent chance that you're going to miss the a quota of someone who's really excluded and really you know thinking well you don't have a quota for me so the more diverse your board can be the more likely you are that those people you know one person who is um, not kind of typical in, in some way might see five other types of people who are being excluded. So, um, yeah, I think quotas is a big no-no. <laughs> <laughs> Fariva, please, go I ahead. Would, yeah, maybe I would maybe hardly disagree, of course, in an ideal world, and um, quotas are not necessary at all. And also, yeah, c concerning this topic of affirmative action, I think there have been many programs in the in the last years and also in the context of Vienna, I know it, but also to really uh, this... this uh, it's a pity that there are calls need to really ask for, I don't know, um, people from certain underrepresented groups to do applications, etc., or that there are certain stipends for post-migrant people in a society, so uh, um, uh, non-Austrians in Vienna in this case, for instance. But uh, reflecting these, these um um, these calls, organizations, or these initiatives um, over a decade or something, it's really like that they uh, changed something. And as long as the, not 
all levels of production in the artistic fields are diversified and representing um, what our society is consisting of. So certain measures can be helpful on the way to coming there. Of course, I'm totally against uh, special calls and special ways for under people of underrepresented groups and uh, with certain um, biographical uh, context, but in order to get these artists and these voices um, onto a certain level um, where they have more visibility and can also change the, the art sector on a sustainable level, it can be very helpful, I have to confess. Okay, so Chloe, I think you're going to have to be the deciding voice here. We have Odette who says, no way, no to quotas. And we have Fariba who says, maybe as a temporary measure, as a means to an end, to make sure that we've got the good representation that we need. How do you feel about this, Chloe? So, actually, yeah, you're totally true with uh, Odette and Farida. We, we, we have the same kind inside the iProtunus Consortium. We have the same kind of uh, discussion for, for a very long time. And at the end, um, we decide to much more recommend not to have quota, but to be very attentive, to pay a lot of attention to diversity and to inclusiveness at all the step of the program. So as Farida and um, Fariba, sorry, and uh, Odette said, it's very important to have a diversity in the in the committee, for instance, at the very beginning of the process in the committee, but also for all the tools, as I said before, and it was for um, artists and cultural professionals with disability, but it's in, in a way it's for everyone. We have to be, to have the tool and to the resources uh, that are very accessible. It means in the website, we should use a simple English. We should have an application that a lot of people can read and can apply for. So all the tools also have each, each time we build a new and we elaborate a new tool, we have to think about this diversity and this accessibility at this level. Also, I think the fact um, we also have to, um, we also recommend to go and look for help for other organizations who know how to do that very well. So when disseminating the information of the applications, for instance, we definitely should work um, end to hand with specialized networks and non-artistic organization also who will much more better than us know where to uh, spread the info. So this is also an, um, an important clue for uh, diversity. Also, uh, and I will come back to this to this point, but the the main um, point of hypotenus was also to choose to um, make a mobility scheme and to have as a beneficiary the individuals. And this is also for us a way to ensure diversity and from diversity to ensure inclusiveness. The fact that we, that hypotenus um, made this point and decided to have as a beneficiary individuals, uh, it's a way to, uh, through them, to um, make them able and to trust them in the fact that they will choose the host that better suit to their project. They will probably have a very um, good, uh, they, they, yeah, to, they, they will choose the host that better suit to their project. And in this way, they will make enter much more hosts in the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had, we saw on the video, a very different kind of project, but also we can, we just to remind that a host can be an individual person. It might be a, a writer who will host, uh, um, who will host a translator, for instance. It, it, it might be association with very few people, or it can also be very uh, big structure, much more formalized. But the fact that we give the opportunity to the beneficiary, to the artist to choose his or her own host, um, make them make a much more diversity possible inside the, the program. But, and I will just end with that, uh, it doesn't mean that we just have to leave the host by themselves and just understand how to be a host just by themselves like this. So we also have, and we also recommend as a, as a consortium to develop the tools for the host to know maybe how to welcome an artist, how to work with a, a, a musical band, how to, uh, to, to, to make the, the mobility uh, the better possible. Brilliant, so relevant. And we hear that time and time again, this is not, our focus is on the individual artists, but we need to support all actors in this network to make sure that we're being inclusive and of course earlier sustainable. 
We only have a few minutes left, I'm afraid. So I'm going to take the opportunity to come to you, Odette, because I think, like me, a lot of people have just heard it was an in-person program and because of the pandemic, we had to make it digital. What is a digital residency? Is that, that must be more than just meeting online, right? What, tell me, tell us in a nutshell how we can define a digital residency. Um, well, I think, um, and I heard in the last panel and I did agree to some extent that all of this Zoom is very tiring and um, kind of off-putting for people. But I think when you think about a digital mobility, a digital residency or even a, a hybrid model, you're talking about in the way that a travelled residency would be, um, you are shifting an environment for people. Um, the artists um, will obviously take part in some online meetings but there are other ways that you can have contact which aren't necessarily um, a meeting like the one that we're having now um, you can have kind of very soft contact very structured contact um, you can do mirroring of of work um, and you also have to take a lot of care to um put parameters around time because a residency or a, a digital uh, a um a travel mobility has a time limit um, and you can also go quite a long way to um, encourage uh, an artist to change their own environment. So there is a lot that you can do. It doesn't have to just be um, clocking in for your, your daily Zoom meeting. And yeah. let us know very quickly, what steps did you take to ensure that a digital program was accessible? Because obviously there is a certain threshold that would overwhelm certain people to say, oh, it's digital and I have to, oh, is that a new platform? There, there must have been thoughts in your head to think about how you can make that as inclusive as possible. Yeah, and I think that um, another point that came, I think maybe Dea raised in the last panel um, about, uh, somebody raised this point about internet access not being universal. And I think that's absolutely right but um bef before we get to that very difficult problem an easier problem to solve is to not put big technological barriers in front of people um and use difficult platforms and um you know make things more complicated than they need to be um if you just stick to the idea that we need to be together in some way um and it's as simple as that use use apps that people already know how to use you can just use whatsapp and and zoom or you know um Anything else that's going to put in an extra barrier is probably not your friend. Yeah, I like that. I think that's mirroring what we heard before about achieving a sense of belonging in a physical sense, but also mirroring that with an online community. I'm afraid we're out of time. That flew by as well. I would like to talk to you all all afternoon, but I cannot. So thank you so much for joining us, Fariba. Especially thank you to you for jumping in again. I hope you have a brilliant afternoon. Stay with us and enjoy the rest of the event. But now it's time for us to come back to the audience, make sure that you're all awake, and we're going to run a little poll. So please jump back onto Slido under the same link you saw before. It should be entered into the platform now. And we're going to do a quick poll to understand what you, the audience, think are the big takeaways for now. So the first question of the poll is, what should be the priority for the European Union to support mobility of artists and cultural professionals? Do you feel it is to propose a European status for artistic and cultural professionals with harmonized social security, taxation, wages, etc.? Do you think it should reflect on extending mobility schemes to artists residing in non-creative Europe countries? Or to regulate transpo transportation rules to facilitate the access to sustainable mobility, more rail infrastructures, no flight under certain numbers of kilometers, and compensation funds, for example? You've got 20 seconds to share your vote. You can see this on the screen now. This is pretty impressive. 83% of the audience want to propose a new European status for art artistic and cultural professionals. 45 want to regulate the rules and 30% want to reflect on extending mobility schemes to artists residing in non-European countries. So we've got a good mix there, um, but it's definitely, definitely a first one for everyone. So that was our quick poll. I have the great pleasure, speaking of wrapping things up and learn lessons learned, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Barbara Gessler, head of Creative Europe, into the studio. Barbara, come and join me here. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Please go ahead and tell us about your lessons learned and your big takeaways from today's event. 
This was a very interesting event, Corey, and uh, we've been listening very carefully, obviously, from the side room, scotched and glued to, to the screen and the discussions. Um, I think we've, we have a lot to take away from these, uh, from these interventions. The questions that were raised are those that we are also looking at uh, in terms of our Creative Europe program as a whole. Uh, the issues that you have mentioned, for example, inclusiveness, uh, environmental concerns, sustainability, dimension, etc., are already uh, cross-cutting priorities for the new Creative Europe program, uh, which has entered into force only this year, and which will also, of course, be the legal basis for the future mobility um, scheme. So already we're looking uh, together in, in the same direction, which I think is extremely uh, encouraging and obviously not a surprise uh, because the way this was set up in a very professional way, uh, you also thought of those, uh, thought of those things uh, as, as the results also of what was learned uh, over the previous years in the Apportunus testing phase. Um, my I have a few takeaways from these uh, from these discussions. One of them, and I think it's maybe a little bit obvious, but uh, I wrote down uh, non, not one size fits all solution. Uh, and we've just heard it. Uh, we've just heard it again that uh, if if we're looking at individual mobility, this is already a very inclusive idea, if I understood uh, in particular the last panel correctly. So if you're looking at the individual, you cannot have a scheme that is really uh, correct and fair to everyone unless you make it really tailor-made. So uh, looking at the individual needs as much as possible, uh, lowering at the same time bureaucratic uh, approaches, that uh, bureaucratic burdens and barriers, obviously, that's a necessity, because that's potentially also a burden for uh, participation. Mm -hmm. So we need to definitely uh, try to be as, as precise as possible, but at the same time as open as possible, I would say, in order to uh, allow uh, inclusion. Um, I, I have also very much uh, uh, seen the ideas uh, to look at when it comes to reflecting on, on how to travel. You know that mm -hmm. uh, under Creative uh, Europe in the other projects, in the cooperation projects, for example, we are asking our project organizers to think about uh, how to travel uh, and, and to tell us what they think how they have reflected upon taking this dimension into consideration in their application. We don't necessarily oblige all our projects to be, uh, in that sense, ecologically correct, because at the same time, and this is the second aspect of what we heard, we don't want to create new barriers. We heard very much that there may be, unfortunately, a risk of create, creating new imbalances. For example, if you travel from territories that are so far away that you cannot possibly sail, walk <laughs> or, you know, travel by bus unless you have a lot of time and also all these ways of, uh, of, of new concept of traveling I think is something that we will definitely look at when we form a, when we uh, when we look at the formulation of the new uh, of the new call so we are not uh, obliging everyone to do the same thing mm -hmm. and to there was a question in the chat uh, everyone to travel sustainably uh, in that sense but we we ask everyone to think about it at least and that's I think already a strong incentive um, and uh, uh, at the same time uh, I think that, uh, uh, that, that we have to be very careful also to look at a broader concept of sustainability. This also came through very strongly. Sustainability is more than just uh, the ecology. Uh, 
uh, and it's it's also about equal opportunities and you may know that we are also working currently in in the DG uh, in a in a in a working group with member states on the status of the artist so we are already aware that this is a topic and that we need to look into this uh, and that the burdens and barriers to uh, cross-border mobility uh, need to be looked at also in other terms and not just funding. So I think in a nutshell, I mean, I don't want to repeat everything that was said uh, in the past uh, two hours, uh, but this is what I would uh, uh, really take away. I have also noted down, let me just say that as a last word, that you have asked us to look into affirmative action, maybe, or quota. So far, we, we don't have quota uh, at all, uh, uh, for, nor regional quota, for example, mm -hmm. geographical quota, etc. But as I said, inclusion, uh, in particular is one of the cross-cutting priorities of the program and it will definitely play a role and we will uh, we will have to make sure that we become even more inclusive in this broader sustainable concept that we that we learned about today fantastic thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your thoughts with us that was a fantastic wrap-up to an incredible day with lots of different voices perspectives a lot of interesting people came to share on such an important issue of, of mobility of artists, and I'm so pleased about that. We are now joined, Barbara and I are now joined in the studio, virtually of course, um, by Tamach Tsuch. Tamach, you are on the screen now. Thank you so much for joining us. You are the director of the DG EAC, and you are also going to share a couple of concluding remarks with us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, first of all, uh, I really would have liked uh, to stay as long as possible and join as early as possible. But unfortunately, I had no time uh, to do that. Uh, I must also relay uh, the warm greetings uh, of Temis, our director general, who also would have liked to participate, but was facing the same problem. So I only joined when uh, you actually did this poll. Uh, so I saw the results, 83% want a European status for artists. In that uh, aspect, uh, probably uh, many of them, or many of you, I may say, know that the European Parliament accepted a resolution calling for uh, such uh, a European artist status. We have already started to examine this uh, within the Commission services. Of course, it doesn't uh, involve only EAC, or I would say not mainly EGAC, because there are a lot of other services who are in charge of the various aspects of this issue. But we are working on it. And uh, most importantly, we will uh, get in touch with the member states who have the real competences to sort out these issues. So in principle, we are with you, and we will hope that uh, sooner or later there will be uh, substantial progress in this area. Now, concerning uh, the specific issue of the new scheme, uh, I, I think probably Barbara mentioned also, and uh, it was already discussed, uh, that we are planning indeed to launch uh, a new scheme. Uh, and before going into that, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Goethe Institute and also the other partners who have been managing the pilot projects. Uh, this was done in a very appropriate manner, and uh, it became a real success as far as we understand the feedback from the stakeholders. Part of this was obviously due to the good management, the flexibility and the commitment which has been shown by our partners. And uh, therefore, we are really grateful and uh, we hope that uh, this will continue throughout this year, sorry, next year also, <laughs> this year and next year, uh, for the remaining part of pilot project. And then uh, we will see the same kind of uh, attitude uh, for the real one. Uh, in addition to the good management, flexibility and commitment, I think the success of this iPortuno scheme is also due to the parameters of this scheme, uh, which include, as you know, that this action is demand driven with applications directly from individuals according to their needs, which is uh, something completely new in this process. The administrative process is light 
if you are really skillful, uh, you can do the application in two hours, which may sound a lot for a normal human being, but I think for those who are used to deal with these kind of applications, it's a major success, I must say. <laughs> Uh, also, the mobility duration is a flexible period. Uh, we provide a lump sum uh, without extremely rigid rules on how to spend it. Of course, we will carefully uh, take care of that is used for a good purpose, but there is no, I mean, very limited uh, bureaucratic uh, obstacle. The action is very inclusive with few eligibility criteria and supports both emerging and established artists in many sectors. Mobility for culture, of course, is of very high importance for the sector. Of course, we saw, unfortunately, a reduction of mobility with the pandemic restrictions, and that's why we want to increase the support at, indiv at individual level. Hence, uh, the new scheme. Uh, to summarize a bit uh, what we are planning, uh, also in view of the discussion we had today, uh, we believe that uh, the main characteristics of the iPortunus should be maintained. Also the bottom-up uh, approach, the simple administration, the accessibility. Of course, there is always room for improvement. Uh, and uh, one improvement, which I think would be welcomed by everyone, including you, the European Parliament, and everyone else, is the increase of budget. Because as you know, we will uh, have uh, seven times more than uh, what was given in the last three years. So this is really uh, a very big development and a very uh, a development which is welcomed by everyone. Uh, the method of individual applications, uh, also from hosts or hosting organizations, uh, will continue. And uh, we realize that in practice, uh, the attraction of the scheme uh, was uh, exceptionally appreciated by the emerging artists, the young generation. Therefore, we are reflecting on how to connect this uh, with the European Year of Youth in 2022. We are also reflecting on how to link the scheme uh, to other important global priorities on sustainability, on environment, the Green Deal. You have just discussed this with Barbara. And, uh, well, I think uh, these are really the main issues which I wanted to share with you. Perhaps one last uh, notion or concept which I should mention is that uh, although we like very much the iPortunus, uh, probably it's time to find a new name for the new project. So we are reflecting very strongly what that new name could be. If you have any ideas, I mean, don't hesitate to share with me at this very moment or <laughs> later on by any other means. So thank you very much again for the invitation and also I thank once more the Goethe Institute, the whole team, uh, the European Cultural Foundation and all other partners who have been our passengers on the same train. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tamaj. Had I known that you were going to ask about the name, I would have included this in our poll. We could have asked the audience what the next name should be, but I, I did not. I do, however, dear audience, have one last poll question for you that I'd love you to answer before you leave us this afternoon. If you jump back onto the Slido tool, you will see the question, and it is as follows. What should be the priority for the next scheme, Ipertunus? To support artists and develop more sustainable projects, to make schemes more accessible to artists from different backgrounds and from less represented groups, to include a hybrid mobility scheme, including an online element, or to develop communication channels and network to reach out to artists from less represented countries and areas. Don't worry, you may vote for more than one option. <laughs> we are aware that they're all very important points. Please do share with us the final voting and we'll have a look at the results in just a second before we close. The results are already coming in. The very first answer to make the scheme more accessible to artists has very much the largest vote at 63%, but we do see that the other answers are always already um, and also reaching around a 30 to, 50, uh, 30 to 40% mark. 
So we see that they're all highly relevant, but we do all see the need for the accessibility and less represented groups is uh, really our, our focus. So thank you again to Tamaj, thank you again to Barbara for joining me in the studio. Thank you to all of the brilliant speakers, to everyone who collaborated at making this a really valuable discussion today. I think we can all agree that we're very excited to see what the next scheme will bring. And on that note, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And again, you can catch the recording after the event about two weeks afterwards, complete with subtitles. So we'll hope you watch it back. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>